the service with a call to worship. The call to worship is on page 46 in your hymnal. It's from Psalm 24, verses 1, 9, and 10 here. Psalm 24, 1, 9, and 10. The earth is the Lord's, and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. This morning as we come together, we worship this King of glory. And so we'll begin this service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Will you join with me in standing as we sing our opening hymn, hymn number 64 in the gray hymnal, All Creatures of Our God and King, hymn number 64 in the gray hymnal. Yeah. <laughs> 
Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To them that believe on his name, he gives a power to become the sons of God and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson this morning comes from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 1 through 9, and that's found on page 323 of your pew Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 32, beginning with the first verse. Listen, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teachings fall like rain, and my words descend like dew, like showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. I will proclaim the name of the Lord, O praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. They have acted corruptly toward him. To their shame, they are no longer his children, but a warped and crooked generation. Is this the way you repay the Lord? O oh, foolish and unwise people, is he not your father, your creator, who made you and formed you? Remember the days of old. Consider the generations long past. Ask your father, and he will tell you, your, your elders, and they will explain to you. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the peoples, according to the number of the sons of Israel. For the Lord's portion 
is his people. Jacob, his allotted inheritance. Here ends the first lesson. The second lesson this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 3 through Hebrews chapter 4, first verse. That's found on 1865 of your Pew Bible. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 3, beginning with the 12th verse. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end uh, the confidence we had at first. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with the, whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of us be found to have fallen short of it. Here ends the second lesson. Excuse me. The gospel reading for today is found on page 1658 of your Pew Bibles. That's John chapter 6, verses, six, verses 66 through 71. Again, that can be found on page 1658. John chapter 6, verses 66 through 71. I'll invite you to stand out of respect for the gospel. Glory be to the Lord. John chapter 6 beginning at verse 66, reading in Jesus' name. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. Here ends the gospel reading for today. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Will you join with me in confessing our Christian faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed? That can be found on page 32 in your blue hymnals. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our next hymn is hymn number 379 in the gray hymnal, Take My Life and Let It Be. Hymn number 379 in the gray hymnal.
take my hands and lift them up at the impulse of thy love. My feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. <coughs> and let me sing always only for my King take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee filled with messages from Thee take my silver and my gold, not a might would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou dost choose, every power as thou Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. My heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my treasure store myself and I will be ever only all for thee ever only all for Josh liked to listen to his great-grandpa, Alfred, share stories. He would often share memories of working with his dad in the vineyard. Josh tried to picture what the layout of the land was like. His great-grandpa's field was close enough to the city, outside the city, but close enough to still see the hustle and bustle going on in the city. He saw the smoke from the fires in the city. Alfred had often gone into the city to do business with the city folk. The sights and sounds he described always intrigued Josh. He wondered what it would be like. Alfred spoke fondly of his homeland, optimistic that he could one day go back, yet cautious, not wanting to get his hopes up too high. Still, Josh told himself, one day, one day I would make the trek back to his homeland to see where my great-grandpa grew up. Some of you have had a similar opportunity to do just that. Head back to the old country where your ancestors emigrated from. Or maybe it's not the country of where you, or your nationality, but the state or the city or farm where your parents or grandparents grew up. And when you're there, you imagine what it was like for your mom to have been a little girl playing in the yard. Or your dad being a rambunctious little boy getting into mischief. It's fun to think of, isn't it? Did the mic die? Stay tuned. Well, do you want to? Is this really hot?
one over here? Okay. Well, stay tuned. Sorry, everyone. <clears throat> So while you're take three. All right. Still a little hot. We good now? Okay. Well, we'll go back a little bit. The sights and sounds that Alfred described always intrigued Josh. He wondered what it would be like to go back to his great-grandparents' farm, to experience what it was like when his great-grandpa was there. Alfred spoke fondly of his homeland, optimistic that he could one day go back, yet cautiously guarded, not wanting to get his hopes up too high. Still, Josh told himself one day, one day, I'm going to go back there, and I'm going to see where great-grandpa grew up. Some of you have had the opportunity to do that, to go back to the old country where your ancestors emigrated from. Or for others, maybe it's not the country of your nationality, but the state, the city, or the farm where your parents or grandparents grew up. You imagine what it was like for your mom to have been a little girl playing in the yard, or your dad being a rambunctious little boy getting into mischief. It's fun to think of, isn't it? We've always just known them as mom and dad, the responsible adults that they really are. The day came rather unexpectedly for Josh. He came inside from playing with his friends to the hustle and bustle of his parents talking and packing up some belongings. And intrigued, Josh asked his parents, what are you doing? We're packing, they said. Why? Josh asked. We're going home. Alfred said with tears in his eyes. Confused and curious, Josh asked the question, what do you mean we're going home? We don't have to stay here any longer. The king just said that we can go home. The king, Josh thought to himself. His parents never really talked too highly or too kindly of the king before. Even though they'd both grown up in this place, they never really claimed him as their king. He was the king, not theirs. He was always spoken of as an outsider, as someone they just had to put up with or deal with for a certain time, or at the very least, reluctantly listen to his decrees. This was different, though. They were shocked, yet excited, not sure how exactly to handle this new decree of the king. Nevertheless, they packed up their belongings and would soon be heading back to the old country. <clears throat> what did the king say? Where were they headed? Why were they leaving? Josh and his family were about to be reminded of an important lesson that was true then and is true still today. I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, as we read what this lesson is that they are going to learn. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And if you're able, I invite you to stand out of respect for God's word. Reading in Jesus' name. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with the freewill offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the heads of fathers' households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose, even everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. All those about them encouraged them with articles of silver, with gold, with goods, with cattle, and with valuables, aside from all that was given as a freewill offering. 
Also King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and put in the house of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought out by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and he counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. Father God, these are your words, and your word is true. We pray this morning that you would sanctify us in your truth here today, and Lord, help us to see you and what it is that you are doing even now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. The lesson that Josh and his grandpa were going to learn is that the Lord is at work fulfilling his word through mankind for our salvation. The Lord is at work fulfilling his word through mankind for our salvation. The story of Josh and Alfred is a made-up story. They aren't real people, but it gives a sense of what it might have been like during that time. That time when you were foreigners in a foreign land, having been there for 70 years, still sharing memories and speaking highly of the time before you when you were in your own land, before you were taken captive. The Lord had spoken to his people through a number of prophets to warn them of what was going to happen. In Jeremiah, the Lord mentions that the people are going to be taken captive into Babylon. And he encourages the Israelites to leave Jerusalem, saying it's not going to go well for you if you stay here. Go into, Jeru- or go into Babylon. In fact, one of the most quoted Bible verses is taken from this very context. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. And in the verse right before that one, the Lord says this, When 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. So God says, go to Babylon. I know what I'm doing. Trust me. And then after the For I Know the Plans passage, the Lord continues and gives this promise. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. And then comes a theme verse from our VBS a few weeks ago. You will seek me, and you will find me, when you search for me with all your heart. God had promised to do a work in the captives of Judah who were displaced in Babylon. And they were encouraged to build and to plant and to put down roots there in that foreign country because they would be there for a while. Though they were going to be there for a while, it was only going to be temporary. Seventy years, the Lord says. You can imagine the older folk who left their homes when they were kids, counting down the years and the time seeming to crawl by. But for those of you who are 70 and older, it's really not that long of a time, is it? Not really. Time marched on. The Lord never forgot his promise. And when the time was right, the Lord worked a miracle to bring his people back to Jerusalem. We may not have a specific promise from the Lord to tell us how long we have to wait here on this earth until he takes us home like these people in Jeremiah 29.10. But you and I have also been given a promise in God's word, a promise the same one that Christ gave to his disciples and to all who believe in him in John chapter 14. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me, my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. It's a precious promise of Jesus, isn't it? One day, one day we get to look forward to this dwelling place with Christ for all eternity. This world of sorrow and pain and suffering is not our final home. We are strangers in a foreign land. And the more and more that our culture progresses, the more and more recognizable it is to us. Like Christians who hold fast to the word of God are weird. They stick out, don't they? They're culture or counter-cultural. We march to the beat of a different drum than the current zeitgeist of the world, the current current that the world is in. In the midst of that tension, we have this precious promise to hold fast to that God is preparing a place for you, a place for me. 
the place where we will dwell in his presence and the presence of his Father forever. Oh, what it would be like to go back. And you think back to that story of Josh and Alfred, the tears in Alfred's eyes, hearing finally, you get to go home. The joy that there must have been to the people in Judah to be able to go back home again. One day Christ will come and take us there. In the meantime, we hope, we wait, we anticipate, we put down roots, we work and we go about our business, faithfully following the Lord's instructions to love him and to love our neighbors, whomever they may be. The Lord was fulfilling his word here in Ezra chapter 1. That word about bringing all the exiles back to Jerusalem, back to the place of temple worship. He was faithful then. He is faithful now. And even though we may not see it, feel it, or realize it now, the Lord is fulfilling his word. Christ has gone to prepare a place for you. One of the reasons we may not see the Lord fulfilling his word is because he does it in a way that we may least expect it. Who would have thought that this pagan king would have let the Jews go back to their own land to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed? Look at what Cyrus, the king of Persia, says in verses 2 and 3. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Cyrus accurately announces that this isn't his bright idea. He doesn't wake up one morning and say, you know what, I've got this new idea, and we're going to just see how it plays out. But he realizes he's answering to a higher power, namely the Lord. The Lord has placed him in this position of power and authority for such a time as this. And what is it that he does? He lets those from the tribe of Judah go back to build the Lord's house in Jerusalem. And later on in verses 5 through 6, Cyrus encourages all of those who stay behind to contribute to this work, to give of their gold, their silver, their cattle, and other valuables, but also to give a free will offering for the building up of this temple again, given by the ones whose hearts had been stirred by the Lord. It was evident that the Lord was still working, working in the life of the king, working in the life of those Jews who are heading back to the promised land, working in the lives of the ones who are giving of their silver and their gold and their cattle and their valuables to the people who would go as they stayed behind. The Lord is working through Cyrus as well as those who stayed behind and helped sponsor the work. Cyrus himself seems to be an unlikely candidate for this. Who in their right mind lets a captured people go back to their own land and their own customs freely? And not only freely, but willingly gives back his plunder from his victories to the ones who are defeated. Well, archaeological records record that that's the kind of king that Cyrus was. He wasn't a devoted follower of Yahweh. He's simply diversifying his deity portfolio. He lets the captives go back to their own lands to worship their own gods with the hope that the more gods he could serve in this way, the better off he was. He's trying to please everyone, especially everyone's gods. If he could have a good standing with all the gods, then it would go well for him. From a secular standpoint, one would say that that's simply the kind of king that Cyrus was. But the students of God's word, they would recognize and see the Lord's hand is at work, fulfilling exactly what he said he would do. The prophet Isaiah, some 200 years before this event even takes place, before Jerusalem is even captured by the Babylonians, the Lord speaks through Isaiah and says this, It is I who says of, note this, Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem she will be built, and of the temple your foundation will be laid. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, 
whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him. I have also called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor. And note this last phrase. Though you have not known me. Cyrus doesn't know the Lord. And yet this is what the Lord is doing through this pagan king. God is at work through Cyrus, this pagan Gentile king who doesn't know the Lord, to accomplish the Lord's will and to bring his people back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. The Lord's hand is at work fulfilling his word through mankind, through those who don't even know the Lord. It was true then, and it's true today. He is using people of all walks of life to accomplish his purposes. The Lord is still the one on the throne. The question comes, though, why? Why is the Lord using these people? Why is the Lord using Cyrus here? Why are they heading back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple? He answers that in the same passage, in Isaiah 45, verse 6, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Looking back at the passage in Ezra, the ex- it's described explicitly there that the purpose is to rebuild the temple. But looking beyond that, why does a temple need to be rebuilt? It's ultimately for their salvation. It's pointing towards their salvation. The Lord is making himself known from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides him, that he is the Lord and there is no other. Even pagan king Cyrus bows to the Lord's authority. But what's the big deal about the temple? Do you remember reading Solomon's prayer from 2 Chronicles not that long ago? Remember the Lord's promise that was tied to the temple? That that was to be the place where he would be found, but also the place where his people would receive the forgiveness of sins. They weren't supposed to build altars anywhere else. This was where the people's sins were to be dealt with. And once the temple was destroyed, they lacked the physical ritual that reminded them that God would deal with their sins and freely offer them forgiveness. Once this temple is rebuilt, worship would again resume the way God had prescribed. And God's people are once again assured that God hears their prayers that God answers their prayers, and that they will, in fact, be forgiven of their sins. Yet there's still more at play behind the scenes. As we look back in the course of all of history, we see God's hand at work and what exactly he's doing. This temple that would be recreated, rebuilt here, though it was far inferior to the previous one, would surpass it in glory. It would be far more glorious than the one that Solomon had built. Not because the external structure was anything fancy, but because this one would be the one that the Lord himself would visit in the flesh. That this rebuilt temple would be the one where baby Jesus is presented at. This would be the temple that Jesus ministered in, and that Jesus would ultimately replace. Jesus tells the Jews in his lifetime, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And they immediately go back to this rebuilt temple and say, what do you mean it's taken years to rebuild this temple? How do you say in three days you will raise it up again? Jesus isn't talking about the temple in Ezra's day, but he's talking of his own flesh. And as history has it, it's exactly what the Lord did. The Lord fulfills his promise through mankind, doing exactly that for our salvation. Christ's body is destroyed. He is killed. And he became the ultimate and the only sacrifice for sin. The only sacrifice that could truly deal with our sin. And his lifeless corpse is buried there in the tomb. And yet, just as Jesus declared in three days, I will raise it up, he rose again. His resurrected body is the temple that can never be destroyed. He lives today to assure us that our sins are forgiven as a historical fact and point in time. He lives today to advocate on our behalf to the Father. And he lives to prepare a place for us to take us to, to dwell with him forever. He is working behind the scenes today, calling all people to himself. 
And the most ridiculous thing of all is he is using us to do that. He is using you and me to call others to himself as we share his word with those he places in our path. There's more to this passage in Ezra than simply recounting historical events. This is a historical accounting of what happened, but we see that the Lord was at work fulfilling his word, fulfilling his word through mankind and through mankind that doesn't really seem to make a whole lot of sense. I can list a whole bunch of other people more qualified than me to be proclaiming the goodness of God to others. And I'm sure each of us can. But God has called each one of us to have a reason for the hope that has been given to us and to share that good news with those around us. He is working, fulfilling his word through mankind for our salvation. And here we see him reestablishing worship the way he had originally prescribed, preparing people for the Savior who would come, preparing people for the ultimate sacrifice who could fulfill the penalty for sin and pay for sin. And God is at work doing the same thing today, fulfilling his word just as he said, working through people, sinners like you and I, even people who don't even know the Lord, working for and delivering salvation to us and to our neighbors. Praise God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are a God who is at work. God, we thank you that you are fulfilling your word, that you can be trusted and believed. You are fulfilling your word through mankind, Lord, in ways that we don't comprehend and in ways that we can't see. Thank you, God, that you are a God who has worked for our salvation and continues to work for our salvation. And not only ours, Lord, but for the salvation of the whole world. Jesus, we thank you for the work that you have done on the cross for each one of us. May this message be on our hearts, in our minds, and also, Lord, on our lips, that all men may come to know you and be saved, to know that you are preparing a place for them as well. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we'll take our offering, and I'll remind you again, it's August. Our missionaries of the month for this month are John and Hannah Lee, as they're serving in Brazil. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We pray that you would not regard our sins nor deny our prayers because of them. We neither earn nor deserve the things for which we pray, but we pray that you would grant us all things through grace, even though we sin daily and deserve nothing but punishment. Help us also to forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against us. Lord, use these gifts that we give back to you to further your kingdom here in our midst and around the world. Be with those who are listed in our bulletins dealing with various health concerns. For Lauren, Donovan, Charles, Connie, Alan, Don, Delane, Dave, Janelle, Mark, Judy, Steve, Christy, Rusty, Colby, Travis, Shirley, Jolene, John, and Emily too, Lord. Lord, you know each one of the situations, and we pray that in your grace and in your mercy, your will would be done, that you would bring healing. We pray for the residents of our nursing homes and assisted living. We think of Edna, for Erna, and Helen. Watch over them, Lord. Be drawing them closer to yourself. We pray for those also who are pregnant, for Emily and Lydia and Rebecca, 
Watch over them, Lord, and watch over their children. We pray for safe deliveries and that these kids would grow up to love and serve you all the days of their lives. We pray also for those who are trying to get pregnant, for those who have had miscarriages, and Lord, for those who are pregnant and aren't really sure what to do next. Comfort them, Father. We pray that you would be with those in our military, for Aaron and for all the veterans. Watch over them, protect them, and Lord, provide for them as they provide safety and security and so many things for us. We pray for our country, Father. We thank you for our leaders. We pray that you would give them wisdom. Lord, we pray that they would be faithful to the job that you have called them to. We pray first and foremost, God, that they would be saved, that they would come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Father, we pray for our police. You'd watch over them and protect them. Be with our communities as well. Send revival here in our midst, Father. And be with all of those affected by the tragedies around the world. Father, we pray also that these fires that are going on that continue to burn would die out shortly. Be with our AFLC and our Association Retreat Center. Father, thank you for the blessing that all of the staff is and that that center is. Father, we pray that you would encourage each one of the staff and help them to find the rest that they need to get through this busy season of ministry. Be with our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world who aren't able to worship freely. Encourage them and strengthen them in their faith. Be with our seminary interns. And Father, we pray that you would raise up more men to fill our pulpits, more men, men after your own heart, to shepherd the flock of God among us. Be with all the VBS families who sent their kids here. Father, we pray that the truths that they learned would continue to be resonating in their minds and calling them back to you. We pray for our congregation as well, for the work that you have for us. Guide us and direct us. Father, we also pray for the work of the nominating committee too as they seek the replacement for the deacons coming up in January. We pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and that you would reveal the man of your calling to fill those positions. Be with our missionaries of the month for John and Hannah Lee, for their children, Bethany, Eliza, Ada, and Annie, and for John Jr. We pray for the publishing project in Brazil, Father. We thank you that it was approved and that funds have started coming in. We pray that you would use that ministry for your glory and for your kingdom. Be with John as he works with the five Brazilians translating vital free Lutheran teaching materials. Father, go before them. Encourage them in their work. And hear us now, Lord, as we pray together the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 376 in the gray hymnal. I have decided to follow Jesus, hymn number 376 in the gray hymnal.
decide now to follow Jesus. Will you decide now to follow Jesus?